Attention listeners, ahead are spoilers. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Movie Trap. My name is Russell Carlson, and joined with me are my co-hosts, Chris Porath. I don't like fish. <laughs> and my other co-host, Zach Bauer. Because Michelle had to die. <laughs> As the chicks would say. That's right. Um, on the Movie Trap, uh, each of us pick a movie based on a singular theme. And then at the end, when we watch all three movies, which you are in the episode right now, we will vote on which one was the best movie. Uh, this particular theme's interesting because we are uh, right in our Halloween episode. You should be, we're recording this a little early, so we should be right in the throes of the spooky time and Halloween mm -hmm. time. It's probably mid-October mm -hmm. where, uh, right. where you, the listener, are, if you're listening right. day and date. Correct. And uh, yeah, we have gotten our, our theme this year was chosen at random. So no host chose a theme and it was horror movies from before or on 1959. Uh, you are in the third episode, which would be Zach Powers' pick. Uh, previously on the movie trap, uh, the last episode we just watched uh, my pick, which was The Old Dark House, uh, Boris Karloff, James Whale. That was fun. And then before that, we watched the very uh, strangely titled Curse of the Cat People, which was Chris Boref's pick. Um, real quick rundown of the points, because as I said at the beginning, we each get 10 points, but we have bonus points to give out. So let's get a rundown of those points real quick, shall we? All hmm. right, Chris Boref, you have two more bonus points to give out with 11 points at final voting. I have one more bonus point to give out with 11 points at final voting. And Zach Powers, you have two bonus points with 12 points at final voting. So we got a lot of points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, it's it's been pretty. We've been pretty, uh, pretty withholding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Look at us getting off. Well, uh, I mean, I you know, it's been a little bit of a dry spell with some of the movies we've been watching. So yeah, maybe yeah. this one will inspire us to make it rain a little bit. Probably. Yeah. Let's make it rain, or uh, as they say in the French, uh, I can't speak French. So uh, Zach Powers. I know that in <laughs> Spain, the rain falls mainly on the plane. I know France, uh, I'm uncertain. Yeah, yeah. Right. It probably falls everywhere, really. Um, but definitely maybe in a bathtub or hmm. in a very dirty swimming pool. Anyway. Um, uh, so Zach Ch Powers chose 1955's Le Diabolique. I think, uh, is this technically, well, no, we watched Border, but I would say this is one of our first, like, actual foreign films that we've watched, and we haven't watched too many of them on the podcast. That's true, uh, yeah, I'd have to go through to think of think uh, Borders, yeah. uh, this and Border, I think, are actually only true blue foreign films. This is certainly yeah, our first unless, double yeah. whammy, black and white and foreign. Yeah, that's true, yeah, um, and, and French New Wave, too, so yeehaw. All righty, Zach, so uh, without further ado, uh, why don't we get into the plot synopsis of The Devils or Les Diaboliques? Uh, Les Diaboliques, or just Diabolique in the United States, uh, is a 1955 French film uh, directed by Henri-Georges Clouseau. Uh, it stars Simone C... All right, I'm going to... Some of these French names are not going to come out right. Just <laughs> deal with it, people. I did not take... French is not one of the ones I took. Uh, it stars... Simone Signore uh, Vera Cluse, Clouseau, the wife of the director, uh, Paul Messure. Um, and it's based on a novel called, in English, She Who Was No More uh, by Pierre Boulot and Thomas Narejac, Narejac something like that. Um, regardless, uh, this is the story of a uh, cruel headmaster at a boarding school in France. Uh, this man has a demure, uh, sickly wife and a much more uh, abrasive sort of stand up for herself mistress, um, both of whom he seemingly mistreats horribly. His name is Michel de la Salle. Um, his wife is Christina and the mistress is Nicole. Uh, Eventually, it's pretty clearly and immediately shown that he has basically no regard for anybody. He mistreats the employees at the school, forcing them to give up their vacations on a whim. He, uh, you know, heaps uh, cruel punishment on the children and barely feeds them because he doesn't want to pay for food. Um, he beats his mistress. She's first shown with uh, sunglasses covering a bruised eye. 
Uh, he forces his wife to eat rotten fish and, uh, you know, clearly seems to either abuse or sexually assault her as well, while obviously also constantly cheating on her. Um, so this guy is basically a, a real piece of shit. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, the, uh, the actor also uh, in real life was married to Edith Piloff. No, oh, that. or Piaf. Excuse Piaf. me. Piaf. Not Piloff, yeah. not Rice Piloff. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. I missed that. That's a fun oh, little uh, piece of trivia. A, yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. Boy, uh, I did get my point. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, all right. That's uh, maybe the fastest we've ever given one. That's okay. <laughs> um, regardless, uh, Nicole and Christina, far from sort of resenting each other uh, for, you know, uh, splitting uh, Michelle's quote unquote affections seem to commiserate with each other over their shared horrific experiences with the man. And Nicole seems to be pushing Christina into a scheme she's concocted to poison Michelle um, at her apartment. Christina, a uh, Christian woman, God fearing, seems somewhat uh, reticent, um, but his continued mistreatment, including a scene where he forces her to eat raw fish and then seemingly afterwards possibly sexually assaults her or beats her. It's unclear. The scene cuts off, um, finally makes her snap, and she agrees uh, just before a long weekend to go along with this plan. So uh, what they do then is they uh, they run in, they run to Chris, uh, Nicole's apartment in a town called New York. Um, without telling uh, Michelle ahead of time. As soon as he's discovered what goes on, he decides to follow them there, but they have set the trap. In uh, Nicole's apartment, um, they have put some poisoned wine at the ready for him when he arrives uh, with the pretense that Christina will say that she is going to try and divorce him. Uh, at that point, uh, you know, they'll move on to the is, second phase. Is, Go ahead. Is that wine or is that Johnny Walker? I think that's Johnny Walker, homie. That definitely that label. I oh. recognize it anywhere. Okay, uh, uh, Johnny I mean, Walker. Then it's whiskey. They be drinking wine, I guess. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my mistake. Okay. Regardless, it's poisoned is the main thing. Um, so uh, uh, as expected, he arrives at the apartment. Uh, Nicole hangs out with uh, an elderly couple who seems to share the apartment with her because she's not very rich. Um, and uh, Christina uh, again is sort of relenting from this idea. She tells him she's planning to get a divorce, that she has a lawyer. Michelle sees through this and gets her to, you know, quickly realizes she has no lawyer. Um, but uh, she has a change of uh, change of heart and smacks the Johnny Walker out of his hand before he can drink it. He reacts violently, slapping her, and she's like, you know what? Fuck it. And pours him another glass, and he downs three uh, in no time flat. And is immediately out of it um, and goes down on the bed. At which point, uh, Nicole comes in. The two drag him to a bathtub, turn on the water. The pipes are the loudest thing ever. They alert okay. the neighbors. Um, and uh, Nicole drowns him in the bathtub while he is reeling from the poison in the Johnny Walker. Um, Christina... Uh, sort of passes out from the shock of it all after they wrap him in a tarp and weigh him down with the statue. And the next morning, they toss him in a wicker basket and decide to take him back to the school. Uh, their plan being that they're going to dump him in the pool and make it look like an accident. Maybe he just fell in the pool while he was drunk or some such and drown. Um, on the way, they are accosted by a drunk soldier. Um, and have a few various flaws in their plans. The neighbors are like, whoa, this wicker basket's super heavy. We should uh, empty some stuff out and yada, yada, yada. It's almost a weird comedic series of events in some regards. <laughs> there, there's um, a lot of like really like dark humor in this. That's almost yeah. kind of like Alfred Hitchcock. It gets very funny and also very grim at times. Yeah, like this drunk soldier tries to get into the back of their car and they kick him out. And the owner of the gas station is like, look what he did in the back of your car, implying that he peed in the back of their car, but it's actually water from the corpse, theoretically. Um, anyway, <laughs> they managed to get him back to the boarding school and uh, dump his body into the pool. Um, and they assume, OK, in a few days, the corpse will float to the surface. We'll say, oh, God, it was a terrible accident. And that'll be that. He'll be out of our lives. But things go awry 
when the corpse fails to float to the top. Uh, days go by and it stays deep in the pool, uh, including uh, uh, during a segment where some a ball that the kids are playing with falls into the pool. Um, and uh, Nicole trying to exacerbate, uh, or I mean, uh, speed up the, the, locate, the finding of the body, throws these keys to get like a pole to get the ball out. They sink to the bottom and this kid just jumps in that dirty pool and is like, I'll get them keys, but I'll be fine. I love the idea that if that had worked, all she would have done is horrifically scarred that child for life. Very badly. (laughs) But the only thing he finds is the lighter. They use as an excuse to drain the pool, ostensibly to find the keys. Christina's nerves are frayed, but Nicole's just like, we just got to go with the plan. We just got to go with the plan. Um, Eventually, the pool is uh, is completely drained and no corpse is found. But a day or two later, a corpse matching Michelle's description is found in the Seine. Uh, so it seems like maybe somehow his body like fell into the nearby Seine. Uh, to put their minds at ease, Christina goes down to the morgue to identify the corpse. The morgue attendant is like, before you see this body, here's a bunch of questions about what his body looks like, which is fucking weird. Um, But it turns out it's not him. It's just a guy. It's like a brief session of that old game, Guess Who, but with a dead body that might be her (laughs) husband. Yeah. (laughs) He even has like tricks in there. He's like, what's on his upper thigh? And she's like, I don't think there's anything. And then he's like, you're right. There is nothing there. (laughs) Um... Anyway, uh, turns out it's not uh, not her husband. It's another guy um, who kind of looks similar. Um, a detective, a retired detective who happened to be in the area, uh, has overheard all this. A real Columbo type. Yeah, I was and about is, to say, man. I mean, real Columbo yeah, type. Char- Charles Charles Vanell. He is also in Wages of Fear. He plays another seemingly inept character in that as well. Oh. Hmm. Well, he uh, another overheard- Clouseau film. That's why I brought it up. Yeah, right. Well, it was well, the one he made prior. Familiar with uh, Wages of Fear, we're very familiar with it, at least with Sorcerer. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. it, but uh, the nearby the detective um, Alfred uh, decides, you know what? I'm going to become involved with the case, um, which uh, is not something the two women had planned on. Uh, when they get back to the boarding school, a boy has been punished for breaking a window. But the conspicuous thing is, he says that. Mr. Dallasal was the one who punished him. Uh, everybody thinks the boy is lying or crazy. Uh, he's apparently a pathological liar or something. He says he fought a lion at the zoo. Um, but even still, uh, Christina becomes increasingly upset. She decides she can't join the school photograph because all of this stress is putting a strain on her. But when the school photograph comes back, there is a figure in the window who looks like Mr. De La Salle. Uh, further, further seem, making it seem like perhaps something supernatural or spooky is going on. Um, Nicole, at this point, is also uh, losing her nerve and is becoming worried that something strange is going on. She tries to pressure Christina to come back with her to an apartment in York or just flee it completely. But Christina, thinking they're sinners and they need to confess, says, you just go, I, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, Christina eventually confides in the police detective everything that happened, but he doesn't believe her. There's no body. He looks in the pool. There's nothing there. It doesn't quite add up to him. And he tells her to go to sleep for the night, basically, uh, instead of taking her in. But that evening, Christina uh, begins to see a figure wandering around in another part of the school in the windows. Uh, So she begins to follow, uh, seeing this figure here and there, and eventually coming to a room with a typewriter that had just moments before been clickety-clacking away that has Michelle de la Salle's name written over and over again, Uh, at which point someone flicks the lights off and makes a noise, terrified. She runs back to her bedroom, um, you know, clutching her heart. Uh, She goes into the bathroom to get some water, uh, turns to the bathtub, and sees Michelle there drown in the bathtub. And he slowly begins to rise from the tub, uh, causing her to have a heart attack on the spot 
and seemingly die right there. Uh, after which Michelle pops out his fake blank eye contacts and Nicole comes in and it's revealed that the entire time it was a conspiracy between these two to frighten, uh, to frighten Christina to death so that they could inherit the rights to the boarding school, sell it and become rich. Um, but unfortunately only moments too late. Alfred, the retired police detective, has uh, figured this out. And in a very Columbo moment, is like, you wonder what you'll get. You'll probably get 10 to 20, depending on the judge. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, and and I love that he just wanders in and says that with zero backup. Like, yep. old man McGee, long arm of the law, you, you just kill the lady, but I'm pretty sure I can take you both in. You seem like good enough people that'll just come with me down to the station. Let's, let's go quietly now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, yeah, there's there's a strange coda at the end too. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, so a little later, uh, the boy, the boy who was theoretically a liar, who said he had seen uh, Michelle sometime earlier, um, has got his slingshot back and is breaking windows again, as his his I guess his normal routine. Oh. And <laughs> and boys, uh, when boys. when asked about it, he says Christina was the one that gave his slingshot back. Again, the staff doesn't believe him saying, well, we all know Christina died. And uh, so go stand in a corner for six hours. And then the film ends mm -hmm. with a with a card saying, don't be a devil. Don't tell your friends what you saw here today because it'll ruin the movie. Mm -hmm. And that is Diabolique from 1955. Yes, I, I love that it ended with a very classy way of saying snitches get stitches. Yeah. Um, ah. <laughs> just like, don't tell anybody what the ending is. Right. Hashtag your spoilers, kids. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, back when directors were more hands on in their in their marketing. Um, I, I I I saw it coming. I totally saw it coming. Who who didn't? I I totally saw it coming. I mean, when, I mean, we knew something was going to happen once they didn't find the body in the in the pool. There's only one explanation for this. Yeah, she didn't dream. Well, I've I've seen this one a couple times. It's always been fun because yeah. it 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 plays that line with um like is this real or is this not real? And it at the end it's pretty clear. It's like uh it's a yeah a real thing. Meaning it's a like you know it reveals there's it's a gaslight. Sure. But uh, when he gets out of the tub, that is a super well, uh, scary. Well, let sequence. me ask you, Russell. You saw you when we say you saw it coming. I I, I saw it. Well, okay, I saw it coming, and, and it's mainly because when you're re when I was kind of reading up about the production of this movie. Uh, apparently the actress who played Nicole and Cluzo like fought relentlessly. Part of the reason that Cluzo sort of like hated her performance is because she knew the ending and was kind of playing to that. I kind of agree with him. I think she kind of overplays her hand when it comes to- So you, did you read that prior to seeing the film? No, I read it after the fact. Oh, okay. So when I was watching, cause I, I, she seemed, she was shady the whole time. I, I just felt like I had it underlined, seems shady. Um, oh. like that so uh, that's what kind of ticked me off uh, like clued me into what was happening and then when they didn't find the body that's when i was like okay well this is they're 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 bullshitting her um not that i i mean i, I mean this, film. Uh, this is actually the first time i've ever seen it um, yeah i, I did not see the conspiracy angle come. i was unsure i did not see i did not think it was so clear-cut that it was a conspiracy between nicole and uh michelle yeah. uh I mean, there was the is I knew, supernatural. Is it not? I, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I did not uh, see that specific ending coming personally. I, well, I knew there was going to be a twist of some sort. I but, did too, but um, I didn't know that would be it. With that, well, with that lady being shifty, I guess my brain sort of like just gave her a pass on it because she's French, <laughs> and I was like, oh, maybe she's just being aloof and weird and a little abrupt. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess she was actually a a. a a Columbo villain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, the whole plot itself is pretty Columbo too, you know, like the, the bathtub mechanism and then the whole thing of throwing him in the pool. It is very uh, Columbo esque. Uh, well, no, but I actually, I actually quite like this film. I, I like I said, I, I've only seen, cause my only experience with this movie was like my first year in semester one of film school. And it was like, we, we never, it, when you're, when we were that early, we didn't watch the whole movie. We would just watch like snippets. And this was like the French new wave discussion or whatever. So showed clips of this Alphaville, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so it, I've never actually seen the whole film, but um, boy, you said Hitchcock buddy. And that is, I mean, this is 
very well, much like, kind of like a Hitchcock film. Anyway. There's a few. Yeah. I, I mean, one, Hitchcock apparently bid for the rights to this novel. He wanted to make this this particular, well, a, a movie based on the novel at the very least, which has a few differences between the final product. Um, and you can see why, like, it's very Hitchcockian. And, and people do call this guy like the French Hitchcock sometimes. They, they both expressed admirations for each other in their lifetimes. Um, but to the degree that Hitchcock went ahead and bought the team who wrote the novel, he bought their next book, which he turned into Vertigo. Oh. And then mm. that same writing team wrote a movie that Chris has talked about enjoying, Eyes Without a Face. It's one of my favorites, yes. So it's the same writing team who wrote the novel that wow. this is based on and Vertigo is based on. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that. That's okay. Well, you get a point. You did more research than me. You get a point, my good sir. Uh, also, while I'm uh, talking about research, uh, slight mistake. Um, the gentleman was not married to Edith Piaf. He was simply dating her for a while. And I'll take it. specifically, he was a singer and she was like, you know, you're really not good at singing. You should try acting. And then he got this role. And he fell in love. <laughs> 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 um so yeah I, I mean it's it's very thriller-esque like hitchcockian sort of thriller um but i mean you know they're kind of contemporary so i mean is it really hitchcock or did they kind of bounce off each other who knows um, well they have a couple things in common hmm. and i i assume one of you guys are going to bring this up but it's how they treated actors sure they both did have problems with uh, treating actors and particularly actresses hmm. uh poorly hmm. mm-hmm the fish was really rotten. That's the thing. There's, it's a movie where they just have to act, but the fish was actually a rotten, gross old fish, which yeah, there's nothing. It's such a small part in the movie, and they don't really focus on the fish very closely. So the fact that it was rotten, I wouldn't have noticed, and I don't think the audience would have realized either. So it just seems like a very strange, abusive thing to do to your actors. I thought that that whole scene was pretty strange to begin with because there's this moment, uh, this this movie, what I liked about it was that it's very meticulous and detail oriented uh, from the blocking and the and the camera direction and the, the, the art direction or whatever. But like, there's this strange moment where she's eating the fish and all the kids suddenly just like snap and look at her. And it's a very odd and eerie tone to draw. And, and I, mm. I, I don't think Hitchcock would do stuff like that. That that seemed a little bit more of a, a arty, more of an artistic thing that I, I don't, I can't see Hitchcock blocking like that. Um, so this, that, that struck a weird chord for me. And the fact that it was actually rotten makes it a little weirder to me. Cause like, it's almost like, it's almost like he was trying to torture her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It seems like the director might've actually been trying to torture the actress, which was which his, is wife. his wife. Right. But uh, yeah, it's worth noting. Yeah. There's a few things that are briefly like, if we, if I can mention a few things I learned about the production and in regards to how he treated some of the actresses in particular. Um, first, uh, one thing I forgot to mention in the summary, at one point they say Marcel is 34 years old. This man is not 34 years old. He was in his mid forties when they shot this. I don't know why that line was in there, but um, <laughs> regardless, the original novel is different in that the person who is killed, killed in the bathtub, is the wife killed by the mistress and the husband who want to start a new life together and collect on her insurance policy. And the twist at the end is in fact that the mistress and the wife put this all together to kill the husband because they were in love and wanted to run off together. Now this was changed. Not that seems more fun. It does seem more fun. And it was changed. Not because bound, uh, the, Wachows the Wachowskis bound is actually oh, okay. genuinely like inspired heavily by this movie. Um, but this was changed. Not because it was not allowed in France in the fifties, there was no Hayes code. So theoretically they could have made that movie. Um, but because the director wanted a role for his wife and thought she couldn't play the Nicole role. She didn't think he didn't think she had the acting strength or the, you know, aggressiveness to play that role convincingly. And he didn't want her to play the wife who dies at the beginning and then shows up only at the end. So he switched it around and added the boarding school aspect, which is actually a really good aspect of the movie. Um, but the actress who plays Nicole, he didn't want her to steal the limelight. So he would often 
like light her face less. There's a lot less shots of her by herself. Um, she was signed on for eight weeks of work. She ended up doing 16. She only got paid for the eight because she didn't read the fine print. Um, yeah. Uh, they did not care for each other, as Chris noted. One of the reasons mm -hmm. is um, briefly, this is, I just read about this director. So this is just like something from his past. When he was younger, he was trying to break into the industry. Guy was, he had TB. He was trying to be a screenwriter. He was in the hospital for like five years, couldn't sell a script. He was dirt poor. He was actually trying to sell lyrics to Edith Piaf at a certain point. Um, he was anti-Nazi. He saw what was happening in Germany and was like, I don't like this and all that shit. He had, his career got hurt by having a Jewish uh, friend. But by the time the Nazis had taken over France, he was dirt poor. And there was a guy in this film company that was in collaboration with Beachy and the Nazis who remembered him and was like, I can offer you a job. And he didn't want to work take this job, but he was so poor. He's like, fuck it. I'll take it. He never made any Nazi propaganda. As far as I can tell, he made a movie about someone sending poison letters based on a real story that the Vichy government hated the Catholic church hated and the left who, who were against the fascists in, the, in France all hated for different reasons. I don't think it was even political. I think it was just a thriller. Um, but it was like, everybody found a reason to hate this movie, even though it was a big success and it was what started his career. And after the war, he was for a time banned from making film because of his collaboration with this Nazi group. A bunch of people um, like came to his defense, including Jean-Paul Sartre, who would later defend like the Rosenbergs and stuff uh, and other really famous, um, like really famous uh, uh, directors like Jean Cocteau and uh, Marcel Carnet. Like all these people came to his defense and they eventually flipped the decision and allowed him to make movies again. But this actress who was like a Jewish activist who played Nicole, still hadn't really forgiven him for it. And that was part of the reason they didn't really get along because he did technically profit from like a Nazi film production company. It's how he got his career started. Hmm. Yeah, so, that was a uh, continental, I believe is what it was. It was a, uh, a Nazi owned, German owned French production studio during the war. I think it was like the only one that existed. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's sort of the 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 interesting part in film history with Italy and France uh, post-war is there is still kind of this reckoning. Like, Italy has a lot more, like, I want to say, like, guilt and shame sort of in their movies, like, you know, Bicycle Thief and Sicca. Mm -hmm. Sure. With, with, with French New Wave in the 50s, it was very uh, kind of conflicted. You know, there was a lot of secrets and a lot of, like, because France itself was kind of embroiled in a mini war within a war, you know. Um, sure. Um, so that's what I've always found interesting. And 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 what I also like about post-war Europe cinema, uh, post-war cinema, is they highlight the buildings a lot more than they used to. Like, there's a lot more highlighting of, they actually go to locations and they actually, like, show it and and kind of demonstrate the the lines and they use what they have like probably i think it's a lot more effective in something like the bicycle thief where everything's kind of ravaged and shitty um and or uh famously in um you know the third man makes use of like post-war sure. italy and and, mm -hmm. that, and 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 carol reed and and you know the kind of beginning of american noir kind of mirrors this era because they're both kind of post-war kind of reckonings aren't they um yeah. And and this that's that's interesting about Cluzo though because I didn't know that um, that's and it makes sense too because like he you would think that there would be there would be some sort of guilt or shame kind of woven into these movies about kind of feeling bad about it. I mean Wages of Fear I can imagine kind of has a little bit of that um, I still have to see that original movie but I mean it's it's it good it it doesn't have it's it's a good movie uh, for its own reasons it feels very much like this one but. Okay. I would say it doesn't have as much guilt as much as sort of everyone involved is an anti-hero. Okay. Mm. So it's one of those things where it's like uh, okay. you as an audience might judge the people involved, but the people involved do not judge themselves at all. Okay. And They're there's... completely fine with their own you could argue... sense of moral questionable. Yeah, stuff. there is. I mean, if there is this idea, 
in this movie, certainly Christina, I think, embodies this idea. And maybe some characters in Wages of Fear, I think they probably do. Um, this idea of doing something you are not necessarily morally comfortable with out of desperation. And that would seem to, to mm -hmm. mirror his choice to work with Continental Films. So there is that. That's that's a good point too. That's a very good point. And it's kind of, it's telling that he makes the <laughs> the Jewish actress be the, the anyway. Um, yeah, I, I, that's why. And I also think it's interesting that Christina herself is actually, a she's from Venezuela or some shit. Like she's not, the character's is like she... not all the way French or something. Like she's well, like, her, they... comes from a wealthy family, but they're from Cent like Central America or something. I'll, I'll I'll point something out. Vera Clouseau is French and Brazilian, okay. and she looks very French to me. But yeah. in this one and in Wages of Fear, he has her play someone that is explicitly from a different country, like from South America, or in this case, where they said she's from South America. Okay. It it felt odd to me because it seemed like they made a big deal out of that. Like saying she's from Caracas and a bunch of things, and you're like, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting as a character thing, but it it's... is because like if I'm looking at this in like a post-war kind of the end of hopefully the end of nationalism, although in France that didn't really happen. Um, but it it it's interesting that the the victim of the movie is a foreigner. Um, yeah. I find that an interesting choice. Um, I, I I you know like I, it's I think part of her struggle and part of the kind of struggle with kind of watching this movie is the the dialogue and this might be the translation i mean i i, I can't could, say one way or another there are some but, strange lines yeah and, and and not so much strange that like it's thought provoking it's sort of and, and again this could be the translation we watched it on hbo max um i'm assuming everybody here did or war probably has a fucking no i watched it uh, HBO Max. Uh, i i shelled out the small amount to amazon prime because for some reason on hbo max for me, it was not syncing right. Hmm. Like the audio was out of sync and I tried to oh, restart wow. the app. I tried to restart it and the audio was slightly out of sync. And I was like, I can't watch it like this. But yeah, go ahead. And, and a divergence in terms of this victim being, you know, obviously a foreigner. One other divergence from the book, which obviously the circumstances are different. In the book, they get away with it. Like the two women get away with it. They don't get caught by any detective. That I, was an addition. For that that makes yeah. sense because of how tacked on, you know, Colum uh, French Columbo comes in and just like, well, is. Yeah. off to jail with you. You know, like it, it feels like the psychologist yeah. and Psycho. Like so, this and Psycho yeah. are, are very much yeah, yeah, like yeah. similar. And I think that those two things are like little things that ru that detract from the films both for me, which I think are both you know. It's it's I agree with that because it feels like it's the author insert character to show moralization happening. Right. It's like it's the same thing that happens. It's they're not good books, but when you read the later Hannibal books, like Hannibal goes from being, oh, my God, he's eating people. He's a monster to, oh, well, he's getting at that one guy who did something bad when he was hunting. Sure. And it suddenly becomes this weird like. He starts to become Dexter. Bingo. Where it's like, oh, he's a he's a terrible monster. But there's a moral underpinning and he's got a, you know, it's like the no women, no kids, like killer. And it's like, yeah, this doesn't seem right. It just seems like this should be a fun movie about ladies getting away with murder. It seems like that's a way better story to me. I, I, I Even if it was still the husband and the mistress, like I think the lesbian aspect would be more interesting i agree with that yeah. but i even if it was the husband and the mistress getting away with it i would have been fine with it but really i mean it's literally the the reveal happens and then it's, enters colombo like it's mm -hmm. truly just one more thing right like, yeah it is it's 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 so that felt that didn't ring all that true and i, I did not care for that choice yeah, i i think borf's absolutely right that this was a way for the filmmaker to say see consequences everybody everybody has to face the consequences um and you didn't really need to do that because anyway um i i i and plus you know it this isn't the best murder idea i don't you know like there are, there's got to be a sure idea. yeah it's, it was you know. i think it I th and i think it would be i don't know like i think it probably would be an interesting rewatch to like see I, I think this is a movie that would be fun on a second viewing because you fully knowing what's happening the whole time seeing if you could pick out 
uh, not only the Mr. X on the part of the filmmaker, but the Mr. X on the part of Nicole a little more mm-hmm. strongly. There's early on before the body doesn't, you know, right after they kill him. I think that because the first part of the movie isn't particularly horror. I think this movie has like I phases. Think this, this movie has moments of kind of spooky and and unsettling, especially at the end. I mean, it's a very the end is a big climax. It's yeah, very cool. The end is where it gets the horror title but more yeah, than the anything. The beginning part is very mm-hmm. much like Strangers on a Train. It's, yeah. it's 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 just kind of more of a thriller, really. And then there's, yeah, the part where they're transporting the body in the wicker basket verges on screwball. There's a, it, it becomes a little noirish at points. Are, are yeah, it reminded me a lot of like the trouble with Harry, like when they're just trying does, to get rid of the body and it keeps yeah, getting moved different places. Do you think we can name in this episode, guys? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, I, I think it's a little noirish. Um, I think that there's some interesting misdirects in the sequence where they kill and move the body because I think there's things you're supposed to think are going to matter that are red herrings. Like, oh, the the neighbors heard the pipes and noticed the heavy box. And then the gas station person was like, oh, they, you know, had this box and there was water coming. And you think like maybe the detective is going to be like, ah, I, I'm going back to this location and this location and putting it together. No, that stuff doesn't matter. Right. It's yeah. just a misdirect to like they, lean on the- even that moment where they take the- the the wicker thing out with the body in it and the car does like, like it really cuts close to the shocks going and you're yeah. really like okay somebody saw them with a really low driving car is gonna f- call the cops you're done um you know that so yeah that's a that's another interesting uh yeah uh, trick that the movie does on I, you I, I gotta I gotta ask about one of those though because they do a lot of stuff where it's like especially when the ladies first show up at the place and the one lady seems nervous and you're like why is she nervous and then you realize they're talking about a murder they've planned after it starts happening but there's a weird moment in there why is he so afraid to fall asleep hmm. because well, he's drugged, he, I think he's, so he doesn't really know well I mean anyway yeah but he, we don't know how really he's drugged acting. he is though yeah. i mean he could be acting but he's just like i'm sure I he's want to fall asleep he's probably yet. not drugged at all that's probably true it's just really strange because it's like he knows what's going on like he's in on this whole thing so him sitting there going i don't want to fall asleep yet, it's like yeah, you I mean you're gonna be playing sleepy time for the rest of the movie until you get up out of the tub i don't know it seemed it's odd remarkable. to me i think he's just trying i think he's probably just trying to like hammer home like Cause he was immediately like, Oh, I feel dizzy. I'm not, I don't want to, I'm sure he's just trying to be like, play up like, Oh, it's working. You know, mm. I'm really getting drugged right now, guys. But, but, but he was alone in the room when he said that it was, a, it was a shot of just him by himself when they were fucking around with the, uh, the tub. <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe he thought they heard it in the next room or he was staying mm. in character. Who knows? Okay. Neighbor beating on it with a shoe. Um, <laughs> hilarious. I, I like the neighbors. I did too. I thought they were very funny. I thought the guy was just like writing in his little notebook at 10.05 started back. Mm-hmm. And yeah, what is with the pipes and post for Europe? My Lord. That was like, uh, that, that, and the drains, the drains are insane. It's like, it's like a, a you know, you have to get a, a, a it's like a generator. And, and yeah. Wow. I mean, a drain isn't even that complex of a mechanism. It's no. just, Water going down a gravity. hole. I don't know why it's you so goddamn loud. Does, uh, does did they make it? Work? Did they design the drain like a trumpet horn? So it like. Oh. <laughs> I mean, the only time I've heard of drains or like pipes making that much noise is with the water heater that's on the fritz. So I could understand like a loud water heater well, because that'll be sometimes. In, in yeah, yeah. Water, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah, I, I it's 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 strange to be it, it almost. It, it, almost like that was intentional. Like he wanted it to be the loudest damn thing. It reminded me of a Lynch film almost like where mm. Lynch will use like these audio cues and like exacerbate them to the point of being almost inhuman or alien. Um, and that's what this kind of felt like to me. It's kind of touching on that where it's, it's, it's using that kind of, I would say unrealistic, but hey, I, I've never been to France in, in 1950. So the fuck do I know? Plus all the cars seemed like way up at a, a, not, they were real uh, anachronisms, it seemed like. Was yeah. the film, was the book supposed to take place in the 1950s, Zach, or is it take place? Uh, in like- let me see what it was written. I, I think okay. it was supposed to take place at the same time it was written. It was, you know, uh, I think it was a relatively new book because, okay. as they say, like uh, both Hitchcock and um, Clouseau were like both bidding for this book. So I think it was a fresh, a newly written book. 
Uh, it, um, it's it's in 1952 that okay. the book came out, okay. uh, and I think it is it does play, take Post place in quote place present against, day contemporary. Okay. Well, with with their cars, it would be acceptable to believe that they would all be shitty old cars because they go on constantly about how poor they are. That's right. Yeah. And and you know everyone's still rebuilding. And that's them. and that's I think an interesting thing too is Nicole. Like there are you can infer that she is having. They're like references to her financial issues. Like she has this couple bordering in her place. Clearly, like she's in somewhat dire straits, which itself is a bit of a clue to uh, to the ultimate reveal in the end of the film. It was also, again, I, I found it remarkable that because Cluzo and, and this actress fought because he showed her the ending and he literally told her, like, I wish I would have never showed you the fucking ending. Because and I I I think he's right. I think she overplayed her hand when it came to the kind of shadiness, even with her neighbors. Like she's so, I don't want to say aloof, but she's so inhuman, and you could almost feel like she's toying with Christina. Like you could almost feel this sort of poking at her. And I I, I don't know why I caught onto that. There's early. one scene in particular. I, I I don't think it bothered me. I thought she was just like a very cold, pragmatic. Like I'll do whatever it like because she was already like. I'm going to murder somebody like she was the one pushing to murder. So I didn't need a second layer where she's like, I'm actually pushing for a different murder. It's like, no, she's, you know, she's still a murderer in either scenario. Um, no. yeah. But, yeah. but there is that I, one scene where she's like, where Christina is talking about her guilt and Nicole and she, and she was like, are you sure he was dead? And Nicole's like, you should know you killed him. Like straight up, like, <laughs> You know, you're the one that's going to go down for this if shit goes sideways. <laughs> it's almost like a who's on first bit, too, because they're like, well, you're the one who turned on the bath. Well, you're the one who put on the statue. Well, you're the one who put on the shower mm -hmm. curtain. You know, like yeah. it's just this constant uh, degression of walking through uh, the crime. Um, and it, it's it's it, it was strange. But it I, I actually kind of liked the idea of, you know, it is it reminds me this is a, a movie. Uh, kind of combining two other sources, one being Gaslight and the other being uh, Telltale Heart, you know, because that you, if you think of the corpse being this this body at the bottom of the floor and this beating noise and the fact that her heart is weak, I thought was a pretty dead giveaway on that comparison as well. Sure, um, makes sense. You know, I think um, that's good. I think that's, uh, I'll give you a point for, for that. I think hey, that's a okay. well-observed a yeah, uh, couple I mean, of it's, influences it's the kind of literary influence i'm i'm kind of going with but uh cinematically yeah. the influences are are I, I think unparalleled i think this is a really meticulous uh shot movie the way that cluzo frames all of his pictures in this movie is really interesting um i mean he was way over schedule i mean it was supposed to be an eight week shoot like zach said and he went he doubled that um and I, and, and I don't know why, because it's not like this seems like all that complicated of a production, but when you watch it, considering how everything is layered in the shot, there are lines everywhere. Christina is always behind a bar or near bars. There's this wall around her all the time. Nicole is, like you say, kind of always in kind of a shadow, half shadow. Um, the way that they take the picture and you're supposed to see him, I even thought like, they're gonna they're gonna arrange for Michelle to be in that picture. Mark my word, and then lo and behold, it happened. Um, so I even tried to freeze frame it to try to see it. I couldn't see it until you actually see the close up, and it was cool because it's not really it, it's it's enough. It's ambiguous, piece, but yeah, but it's cool and it kind of it gives that uh, eerie kind of almost supernatural feeling. And then the ending when he's crawling out of the bathtub um, is such a that's really well done. You know, and and what I also I found. Yeah really interesting is that the opening credits of the film it's got this really cool finally guys we have a new horror movie in 19 before 1959 with some fucking heavy organs in it uh, uh -huh. like i was really impressed with that and then they didn't do anything with it like nothing it's there's no soundtrack to this film it is just quiet french talking there was a i, I read the roger ebert review of this and it ended with and i do think like more than any other hitchcock film i do think this one like has a lot in common with Psycho. It's got the twist. It's got the weird add-on at the end. It's got, uh, I mean, some people think that the shower scene is directly like a response to the bathtub stuff in this. There's even, they even have murky water as a the thing they focus on during one of the credit sequences. But uh, at the end of the Roger Ebert review, there was an anecdote about somebody who came up to Hitchcock apparently and said, 
Diabolique made my daughter afraid of bathtubs, and this movie made my daughter afraid of showers. So what the hell am I supposed to do? <laughs> and he said something like send her to the dry cleaners, but uh... <laughs> take her back. Use a hose. Um, yeah, that's that's funny, yeah. I, and that's it. it this I mean, movie, I think. Uh, what what do you think this movie would look like if Hitchcock did this? Do you think he would do the changes that Cluzo did to the book, or who would he try to? Because I mean, he kind of hints at with Rope, because in Rope, there's a there's sure. an implied homosexual relationship. Well, part of the problem is. At the time Hitchcock would have made it, he would have been probably operating in what? Amer he would have been operating in America and the Hayes Code would have still been active. So I don't think he would have been able to do a gay romance. He yeah. could imply it, but I don't think he could do it explicitly. I, I also don't know how much he would go for it. Um, just because he's, uh, in real life, he was not the most woke person. He was very sort of provincial and... Uh, very Catholic in his views on things. I think more Winston Churchill. <laughs> yeah. So like uh, when he did The Lodger, I think he connected the main character in that as being gay because if I'm remembering this correctly, he made the argument in the Truffaut Trof book that the manacles that are used at the end are sometimes used in gay subculture. And I was like, uh, that seems like a weird take, Hitchcock. <laughs> um but uh he would yeah i right yeah right. yeah well i like what do you guys think this one has inspired because i think like definitely devil's backbone has borrowed from this one a lot especially for the ghost parts yeah i i, I think that makes a lot of sense um i, I, I think there's bound earlier i mean that one, bound that's, sure that's pretty much a pretty direct uh, what lies beneath has some bathtub horror that I could see possibly yeah. coming from from this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also, spousal murder. Um, yeah, that's, oh, uh, the, that's the classic cool. film where Harrison Ford opens a window and says, "I think we can take him," meaning he and Michelle Pfeiffer can have louder sex than the neighbors. Can Such a classy Gekis? movie. Gekis do that movie? Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> but I, I think this movie probably has soft influences on a. A lot of movies, some of which may not even know necessarily that this is part of what inspired them. Like, I think that the evolution of the stuff that starts here is probably pretty profound and long reaching. If you, you could probably write a thesis on it. You very much could. I mean, this is why they teach it in film school is because like they, they this movie, as I said, the, the details behind it and the cinematography is really amazing. Like it's, I, I really enjoyed it as far as painting with black and white and the art direction of how specific it is and everything is very meticulous and cool. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. It influences things that it doesn't even know it's influencing and people being influenced. But Zach, uh, Chris, I think you know what it influenced because they remade this movie. Oh, they did. Uh, with with Sharon Stone and uh, 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 Chaz Palminteri and uh, directed by Jeffrey Chentik. Uh-huh. And uh, Isa Isabella Ajani. Yes. Yeah. And none of us, unlike normally, we try to do our homework, but we decided. I, I, I looked up. Uh, the, the, the review score was low um, on this one. Uh, I listened to like a, like a, some people, a short thing of people talking about it and uh, on like a podcast called Queer Horror, and they liked it a little more. They, I mean, they liked it more than the review score would imply, at least. Um, but uh, there is notable changes, uh, most notable, most strongly to the ending. Uh, so there is still a detective character. Uh, that character is played by Kathy Bates instead of uh, this cigar chomping. And by the way, I really. As much as we ragged on the detective character in the original, I loved, I loved the performance. I, I, like he this, was awesome. It, he was great. Yeah, he's, awesome. he's got like a half, a mostly dead stogie in his mouth, one hundred percent of the time. He's yeah. great. He he is also he's also one of the really good parts in Wages of Fear. Yeah. Like when he shows up, you'll see it in that. It's a very different character, but he's also a high point in that movie. Yeah, and there's like things like obviously there's other things we didn't mention that they gaslight him on, like. They have his uh, uh, their cell suit sent back from the dry cleaners at one point, and it's the suit he died in. So at one point, he's like snooping around. He's like, what was he wearing? Oh, you remember the tie super well that he was wearing. Oh, is it this suit that he was wearing? <laughs> like, it's this whole sequence. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, they also find, I forgot to mention, his, his empty sex hotel room, I guess. But that's besides the point. Um, 
But yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway. I just remembered that. Yeah, they don't really go anywhere with it. She goes there, she finds it. They don't reveal anything. He has I a tendency think. to... It's just another He has location. a tendency to stay out late, right? Yeah. So I assume he uses it for... I don't know, aff more affairs? How many women is this guy getting? I, he's not that I attractive. I mean, he's French. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This could be what led to that whole thing about Frenchmen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is actually one thing that's really uh, fun in this. I shouldn't say fun exactly, but I found fascinating for this time period. The fact that the wife and the mistress had a relationship, meaning they were talking to each other, not like romantic, but it was a, I would say not super warm, but an almost amicable level of we're both stuck in right. this, we, we, this abusive guy. Exactly. I think the Even idea initially- after that. The initial idea is that they're supposed to commiserate because they're both involved with this horrible, tyrannical monster, even though eventually it becomes clear that to some degree, Nicole is manipulating her. Um, but yeah, I think that's initially the idea. It's commiseration. Yeah. And it, it's, it's kind of interesting too, to kind of see that because, you know, in wages of fear, there's this kind of brotherhood through adversity, you know, like strife is what bringing them together. So yeah. I think that this is kind of a similar relationship. It's it's different, obviously, because they don't have they're not driving a truck of nitroglycerin, but uh, sure. that same kind of dread and danger is still a problem. But I mean, apparently, so what? Do you think that like Michelle just like okay, here, slap you across there? Now everyone's gonna think that I'm abusing you because I mean, how much was that a gaslight? How much of him? I think they probably saw. I think it was probably to win trust a little bit, okay. um, and I think that I do think that Nicole seemed much less likely to put up with his shit exactly. than Christina was. In fact, I couldn't, I wouldn't imagine, like, let's say they didn't get caught and the story went on three or four years down the line, <laughs> Nicole, <laughs> Nicole, like going ahead and killing him anyway. Uh, not out of the question in my opinion. I, yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I think that, um, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's kind of cool. And that's, it, it's, it, it's, the way the movie kind of pieces out how it makes you, the audience member, kind of put it together, like the sex hotel, like it doesn't See, lay out exactly how Michelle and Nicole pull this off. But by the end of the movie, you're like, oh, okay. Now I see he was staying at the hotel and he was. See, I think, I think, yeah, I think if I. The shower cover so he could dip his nose up and he could sure. breathe, you know, like this. It, Which it is all, clever. It's, yeah. No, that, those are the best kind of twist endings. The best kind of twist endings are the endings that you should have seen coming. Yeah. The, that, those are the, the best it's, kind of twist endings. Twist endings were not super common yet in 55, no. I imagine. Um, but uh, I, I also think, yeah, if I had to rework the ending of this, I think the most satisfying one in some regards would be not only do they get away with it, maybe in that coda, not only is there that little lingering thing about Christina being a ghost, because I think that's fun, but maybe there's a mention that like, Oh, it's so sad that uh, Michelle died just after the died on the honeymoon or something like that. Like, I think that would be a hilarious joke in and of itself. Um, but let me let me briefly say what's different in the in the ninety six remake. Version. Okay, right, nineteen ninety six. Okay, so up till close to the end, it's the same, right? They get the Christina character who uh, who is in this version Mia uh, to find him in like the, the the bathtub, he comes up and she loses consciousness, right? And it seems like she has her heart attack. Nicole arrives, but she, Nicole's not totally on board with the plan in this one. She's like, oh, I don't know if we should have done this. I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but when she looks at Mia's body to confirm her death, she realizes Nicole only passed out and didn't die. So then um, basically having changed a change of heart, um, Guy has to end up attacking both of them, right? They manage to fight and get him down to the pool where they successfully drown him together. And the detective shows up and uh, is like, I'm willing to cover for you guys and say this was all self-defense and put it under the rug. Yeah. So that all the- Yeah, that seems, that seems pretty farcical to me. The only yeah. way I could, here's, you know, because like as I'm watching this, I sort of felt the same way about uh, Sorcerer and probably Wages of Fear. It's a good enough movie that it probably could be remade and made well. Um, it doesn't sound like that. Would it like you can heavily imagine the Coen brothers taking a swipe at this and probably fucking nailing it. Um, but I don't think the twist ending would play as well these days because like I, I, I just don't think, I think people would see it coming a mile away and I don't think it would be. For sure. To people. 
And I think there's there's another um, there's another TV movie version of this starring Sam Waterston uh, uh, Waterson as the uh, Michelle character called Reflections of a Murder. That I think is maybe more or less act, hmm. uh, faithful to the original film. Okay. From 1970. There might have been like a there might have been like an attempt to like make the inspector be kind of a cool like helpful person because they did that a little bit at the time there was like fried green tomatoes where they cover up a murder and a bunch of other stuff where you know it's essentially a police officer going eh it's okay um but it's almost it's always seems strange to me because it seems like the john hughes thing where they don't really hold people accountable and it's just like the cop comes in and says oh well even a cop would understand that this person's a criminal so he's going to look the other way and it's like i yeah they're not weird. white so <laughs> yeah <laughs> a cop would clearly get that yeah 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 a lot of uh <laughs> yes exactly i think that might be a key reason why a lot of that stuff happens in those movies yeah and and that's why i i i this movie is kind of cool in that respect from an, not just an academic sense but i did enjoy it um if you have the stomach for french films i mean like it, it is very much a french film whereas it is going to be people talking in french and saying things in french and that is the movie. Um, yes. It's there's not a lot of action. There's a lot of yes, a French kind of, film in the sense, uh, not not in the sense of Ratatouille, which is no, of course no. just a film that takes place in <laughs> France, right? Or the French Connection, which really has nothing to do with anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So it, it was fun to kind of tackle this era. I love this era of post-war yeah. Europe. It's it's very. Cool. Uh, I'll say this one is a hell of a lot more exciting than last year at Miriam Bowed, which is what I would example as like a French movie where it's literally just people being French talking in rooms about being French for hours and no one does anything. In this one, there are deaths and there's bodies that get hidden and it's a and lot a, more fun. And, and a spooky, I will say though, I mean, it's considering this is the last one of the, of the, of the horror movies one, this is probably the only one uh, that's even close <laughs> to, uh, to being, cause like, I, I gotta say guys, when it comes to the scaries, uh, this round, I don't think we brought it. You know, I, th I think we kind of whiffed on, on on the scaries. Um, uh, a little bit. Are, some are, you know, more absurd and some it's are just hard. Like goofy. Uh, the definition of scary, uh, you know, it's hard to pin down in this early era. Like even if we had gone with, uh, I mean, I think Nosferatu obviously is a horror film, and I think that holds up to some degree. But many films from this era, the Universal classics. I watched those when I was like five years old and I loved them. Loved them. Um, loved them. Loved them. They're not scary series. now. Yeah. They're not, they're not very frightening for a, yeah. for a modern person, and, and, even a modern five-year-old. That was Even a five-year-old in 1993 right, or whatever. Yeah, Bela Lugosi's Dracula wasn't all that scary. It was just cool. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 even so, I tried, when I, when I was doing, when we were doing this round, it was really a lot of work for me to try to put myself in a position as an audience member at that time to allow myself and it's, to be kind of scared. Or and it's worth it. I, I think, I think you and I, at least, I think Chris got hoodwinked is the problem with <laughs> yeah, the first that's round. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. I got hoodwinked by my own memory that was not correct about a movie that was not named correctly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fun story, listener. Zach went to a uh, exhibition and actually saw Museum a Museum of Contemporary yeah. Art in Chicago. Saw a cartoon that mentions how badly the names tend to get screwed up for Val Luton movies. It didn't show Curse of the Cat People, but I expected that to be in there somewhere. <laughs> you know, it was a really, it was a little comic, it was a comic strip that a Chicago artist had created about the career of this producer for Curse of the Cat People. And uh, he also did the original Cat People and I Walked with a Zombie and stuff like that. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting is very early in his career, he went to David O. Selznick and he was like, I don't think we should be focusing on this Gone with the Wind novel I think we should be making war and peace. And Selznick was like, we've already chosen Gone with the Wind. Get out of here. Selznick was never going to give up on that property. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't know and that. I thought read, that was, there, uh, I thought that was an interesting bit of training. book about Selznick that, that is all about that whole journey and kind of what a like obsessive compulsive he was about that property. Well, I'll bet the war and peace movie would have aged better. I'll say uh, that much. Maybe. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Probably, I mean, they did eventually adapt War and Peace with like Audrey Hepburn and shit. 
Um, but yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess uh, we could, uh, I, I, if you guys final judgment, final, final, yeah, we go to final thoughts. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll finish up Diabolique since uh, we got a vote and everything. Um, yeah. I really like this film. It was enjoyable. It, 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 it's one of those movies. I know I like movies, but I'm like, I really wish I could watch this on the big screen. I, I really like to, I think that this movie would be fucking awesome on the big yeah. screen. I really wish I could. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's one of those movies. It's sort of like, uh, you know, a tent pole movie that you didn't realize was really a tent pole movie, but there's a lot of influences going on, uh, stemming from this movie. Um, more of a thriller than a horror, but it gets really spooky at the end that, that him in the bathtub, the last sequence that, that, where she sees the figure, mm-hmm. everything from where the detective puts her to bed till uh, the the point where he returns. Right, is, that, yeah. is a really good sequence. sequence. <laughs> that that that's the closest thing that in this whole round that scared me. So uh, well done, Zach. Yeah, um, I guess I'll go next. I feel the same way. Uh, this was a really fun one. I've seen it many times now, so it was nice to return to it. Um, I. You know, like you've heard us all say, I love the cinematography. I love the sound. Um, One of the things that I have always kind of liked about this is the fact that the end is a little ambiguous. It's very much tacked on. The kid is probably lying, but I love the fact that it ends with the ambiguity because to me, this whole movie is about the ambiguity of is this a really supernatural thing or is there just some bullshit going on? You find out there's some bullshit going on, but they give you that little that little nugget of maybe something is still spooky ooky happening at the end. And I like that. I think that kid isn't lying because, you know, he was already standing there for six hours. I wouldn't lie about that again. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think this is a worth a watch. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't realize when I picked it actually upon researching it, I think I've learned it's even more of a classic than I anticipated when I picked it. Um, I just saw it. I thought it sounded interesting based on the array of movies I had lined it up. It was different. It was foreign. I thought, what the hell, let's try something. And I was pleasantly surprised. I think that, uh, yeah, it, it's, its effects are far reaching. We talked about the things it influenced. I thought of one just a second ago. The reveal that there are two villains, in fact, one of whom you previously thought was dead. Hey, that's very scream. Um, but uh, I'll also say, I wish I had said this up front. I was going to. This is one where, yeah, I, I uh, and I'm sure we will still have our normal warning. The spoiler warning more than normal for this one, because not <laughs> knowing the end can change how you watch this movie. Um, I don't know. I, mm-hmm. Like I said, I figured it out and I still enjoyed it. You know, okay. I, I was, well, you, you know, I've, maybe I enjoyed it because I was like, I was. I mean, it's a, it's but a, not a, everybody's going to be like, I, uh, you know. I'm pretty sure anyone listening this far in has already seen it. Yeah. So I think the spoiler warning is a little late for him, but it's okay. They'll they'll still I go enjoy even, it. I, think. I, I would, I would well, disagree with that, Zach. I think even with the spoiler warning, you could still, this is still a pretty enjoyable film. Yeah. Well, we might get a different spoiler warning, uh, spoiler alert coming up. So if, if we have it by this episode, maybe we could have someone saying, hey, little devils, <laughs> the spoiler warning is... Uh... <laughs> Is especially yes. in effect this episode. Uh, the robot lady might be changing. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so just be bonjour. <laughs> Sacre bleu. <laughs> beep, beep. Mon dieu. Uh, uh, well. But yeah, uh, so yeah, uh, ultimately fun movie. Really interesting. It was a uh, 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 blind spot I didn't even know I had. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so I guess uh, with that in mind, let's get to the voting. So how this is going to work, dear listener, is instead of the winner of this round picking a theme, they will get a free movie, a bonus movie that they get to inflict on us without any consequences or repercussions. Uh, Last year, Borov took uh, full advantage of it with Border and... um, (laughs) This year, so with that in mind, for this theme, Chris Boroff, you have 12 points for final voting. I have 12 points for final voting, and Zach Powers, you have 13 points for final voting. Okay. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, let's get to it. Okay, now I gotta, now I gotta think. Yeah. Okay. I, I have figured out my math pretty quickly.
Yes, that that adds up to 13. Cool. All right. All righty. So, Chris Boreff, what do okay. you have okay. for Curse of the Cat People? For Curse of the Cat People, I gave it a three. All righty. Three, four, Boreff on Cat People. Uh, I gave Curse of the Cat People a two. Uh, there was blatant false advertising in that movie. Yes. Mm. Uh, well, I gave Curse of the Cat People a three. I think there's value in Curse of the Cat People. It was not suited for this round, but I think there is value in the film, uh, and I don't want to over over penalize it. Yeah, that's that fair enough. Um, okay, so that puts Curse of the Cat People at eight points. So uh, I think that one's probably out. Chris Boreff, what do you got for the old dank house? The old dank dark house, I gave it a three because I felt like being egalitarian about how I do the voting on these. <laughs> um, I gave the old dark house a four. Um, it was still pretty enjoyable, but I, I, I wanted to like it more than I was. I feel like the, 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 sum, the whole was not greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, I gave the old dank house a, uh, a four as well. I liked it probably more than you two. And I probably would have considered, you know, stealing a point away from cat people to give to a dark house. Cause they did like a lot of what whale did, but, uh, ultimately landed on the four. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, Chris Boreff, Le Diabolique. I think we know what, uh, it's going to win. Yeah. For Le Les Diaboliques. I gave it a six. I gave it a six because fuck it, it deserves a six. The way, uh, I hope this works out the way I'm saying it because this will be very appropriate. I too gave the Diabolique a six. It did indeed work out the way you hoped. Excellent. I gave Diabolique a six. The holy number, excellent. Six across the board, which is the favorable winner by a mile. Zach Powers wins with uh, the Devils. So, Zach. What have you got for us? I know this is uh, tough. I, I really uh, had a tough time trying to figure this out. The thing about our bonus episode where the winner picks a uh, movie, um, it's actually the episode we released closest to Halloween or this year and last year. That was the case. It is indeed our most Halloween episode. Cool. So I figured pretty quickly I wanted something a little spooky, scary, especially because this round was eh, maybe not so spooky, scary. Um, I considered uh you know early chris lamented he didn't get to choose uh eyes without a face and i considered it because it would be on theme i've never seen it and i do want to watch it this <laughs> halloween season um but we just watched french horror film yeah i think it's okay um mm -hmm. then i i considered very late in the process the new film malignant because i don't know much about it but from what i'm seeing on twitter <laughs> it is fucking crazy um People have but, been suggesting that one to me forcefully, and I haven't given in yet. Yeah, I probably will watch it, but I'll watch it of my own volition. The other one is, you know what? My friend, friend of the show, Brian Flynn, who joined us for Police Academy, you may remember, uh, suggested a movie I knew almost nothing about. I looked it up. The reviews were quite good. It seemed to me um, that came out last year that I genuinely hadn't heard of. And maybe you guys have. Maybe you already saw it. But it seems to be a genuine horror movie. It was released on Netflix. It's called His House. And I never heard the first goddamn word about this. It seemed to get a pretty positive response from what I saw. Brian recommended it. And I'm like, you know what? It's Halloween. I want to watch something new, something spooky. Okay. His House. Seems like any any, uh, any brief you can tell us on what it is? Or is it something we should walk into completely unaware did Brian give you any uh, tips? It's a spooky, it's a spooky house movie. I don't know. He didn't say much about it. It's a spooky house movie about a refugee family. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, this will be fun. We're all yeah. kind of going into this kind of like we're, we're diving yeah. Into I'm the, giving uh, us I'm giving us uh, around the board something that I right. I do not know. I do not know what's gonna how we're gonna feel about this. And you know what? If there's no consequences, fuck it. You know, let's roll. Yeah. And roll. Yeah. Um, I could have also gone with. Um, 
uh, House of the Devil, which is a very weird movie that I don't know if I like, but is interesting conceptually. But uh, I I uh, I know that film. Um, the director's name. It's like Ty West, I think. Ty West, yes. He that movie isn't as good as his follow-up. Like he did yeah. a movie called uh, The Innkeepers, which is Oh, I've seen The Innkeepers. Almost a classic. Almost a classic. Very good. Cool. Well, there you go. I, honestly, but we're going to do his house. I, I'm mm -hmm. surprised. Uh, I'm, this, I'm actually surprised by this pig, Zach. I mean, I kind of figured you were going to do more of a scarier movie just because Listen. of the, the release date. I, I, I honestly thought you were going to finally inflict uh, Black Christmas on Borov. No, <laughs> let's I, save that for the season. Yeah, right. I'm, uh, <laughs> but, I want to win with that one, motherfucker. <laughs> um, but no, no, no. Well, our Christmas episode doesn't have a winner. It's, uh, you that's, know. That's fair enough. Hey, that's true. Really? Um, <laughs> that's fair. All right. Um, um cool yeah but this will be this will be interesting to to do something completely blind and on a bonus movie so uh tune into the next time when we are going to watch our bonus movie and then we're going to thrust back into uh way back in the way back machine when i won the uh the movies from high school round with the clockwork orange uh when we mm -hmm. do sports movies and we will be watching paul newman's uh george roy hill's Slapshot, which we have already covered on this podcast 10 years ago, uh, and we will do it again because I'm a sucker for Paul Newman. Um, okay. Great. Well, I, I don't think I was even a member of the show when you guys did Slapshot, <laughs> because I have never fucking seen this movie. Right. Yeah, and I, I have really very little to, memory of it, so yeah, I'm excited really to go back and look. I really chose that theme just to make Borf's head spin to try to pick a sports movie. Um, I, I can't wait to see The one thing I know the is that it's got a... Was running Man. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it has some crossover with uh, Twin Peaks. That's the one thing yeah. I know about it. Or if it's going to be like Logan's Run, it's right in the title. That's a sport. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, the, the loneliness of the long distance runner. And, yeah. mm -hmm. Uh huh. Anyway, um, so uh, I guess with that, uh, this has been a fun, interesting Halloween time, and we're going to continue yeah. with the spooky scary uh, with his house on the next episode. So join us next time. Thank you so much for listening to The Movie Trap. Uh, for my co-host, I've been Russell Carlson, and he has also been Chris Bora. I'm soggy. Get me out of this tub. <laughs> and my other co-host, Zach Powell. Uh, rubber ducky, you're the one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And as we always say here on The Movie Trap, Diane Ladd is too young to be Chevy Chase's mom. That's The Movie Trap promise. See you, guys. Une baignoire. Diabolique. Un costume d'homme. Diabolique. Une malle en osier. Diabolique.